This Saturday marks 20 years since the abduction of 16-year-old Molly Bish, who was taken from Cummins Pond in Warren, Massachusetts, where she was working as a lifeguard. Her remains were found three years later in the woods of the neighboring town of Palmer, and the case remains unsolved to this day. Carolee McGrath spoke with Molly's sister, Heather Bish, about the case and the Bish family's continued pursuit of justice for Molly. You know, I've been look, thinking back and reflecting this week, and I miss my sister as much as I did 20 years ago. That is without a doubt. Um, but so much has changed in 20 years. I, my father had a stroke. Um, he's recovered, but um, can't be as active as he had previously been. Um, my mom is retired and taking care of him. My brothers had children. Uh, my daughter grew up. She was a baby when Molly disappeared, and now she's going into her third year of college. So, so much has changed, and um, you know, things we didn't imagine um, coming out of this have, have developed. And then there are things that remain the same. I, you know, we still haven't found the person who did this to Molly. We still don't know why this person did this to Molly. Um, and there's initiatives that, you know, my family feels very strongly about, some of them being police training, something that's being really talked about and, and discussed um, right now. And, and one of the things that we had to learn um, the hard way was that our local police officers were not trained in missing persons cases. And so I, I continue to worry about that. I worry about the small towns like Coleraine or the Truro um, towns in, in Massachusetts that are small and the resources are are different. And, you know, although we have mechanisms in place like Amber Alert and, and these tools that officers can use now, um, my fear is that they might not know how to implement these tools because of the lack of training. So that's a, another thing that, you know, we're continuing to work on and, and hope that um, another family never has to experience what we've gone through with losing Molly. And when you talk about police training, in Molly's case, there was a delay in classifying this as an abduction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, what happened is we experienced bias. Molly was 16 years old. She was an honor roll student. She played three sports. This was her second job. Um, she was the daughter of a probation officer and teacher. I mean, we didn't really get away with too much. And initially, the police, when, when it was reported that the lifeguard was missing by a parent who arrived at the pond, the police reaction was, oh, she's probably just with her friends. They didn't check on Molly. If they had checked, maybe things would be different because they would have seen that her shoes were still there and she had left all the belongings that she had there. Um, so the reaction, you know, was was biased. And, and that continued for a few days. I mean, they thought she was a runaway. I remember gathering the next day after Molly disappeared and another police officer that was from our town said, well, she's probably just tripping in the woods. And, you know, we were all like, how could that, that's not, that's not happening. That's, and so you, not only do you lose your, your person, this person that you're, you, you don't know who took there and that, that huge fear and betrayal and, and, and crime happened, but then you have the police who aren't, who aren't taking this seriously, who aren't reacting. And so for 20, for, well, for up seven years after my dad, my dad had the stroke in 2007, he would travel um, the country and speak to law enforcement and say overreact to missing children cases. There's nothing wrong with overreacting because even if you find, that's a, if you, if you find the, the child and even if they did run away, that's a win. And we want wins. We want more wins than we want um, losses. And, you know, we know that these tools work. We've had an Amber Alert in Springfield this past year. Um, so I, I think, you know, these mechanisms in place and proper training, um, we can have better results. And, and we hope that these crimes don't happen that often. But if they do, and even if you're in a small community in Massachusetts, you'll know what to do. Um, so, so that's, uh, and, and again, the crime scene wasn't preserved, um, you know, it was trampled. So that has inhibited our um, investigation even, you know, even today, you know, I mean, I've been literally helping the police try to find a murderer for 20 years, and that's not something anybody should have to do. 
And when you had mentioned the Amber Alert, that was not even um, an option back in 2000 um, when your sister went missing. I know there's some other things that you have pushed for in addition to police training. Um, also kind of looking at DNA and familial DNA. Can you talk about that a little bit as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something I feel very strongly about. Over the past 20 years, we learned that we weren't the only um, family who, who had a significant loss like this. And there are many families um, who've experienced um, unresolved murders. And um, as a result, um, you know, I learned a lot about different in, in investigative tools. And one that's being used across the country in 14 other states is using familial DNA testing. And what that does is it takes um, your CODIS system where all our, our, our criminals that commit felonies are in this um, database. And, it, and if so, if you have an unresolved or unidentified DNA sample, you can match it to CODIS and sometimes there's a hit and you kind of wrap up that case. But sometimes your hit is a partial hit. And what that would mean is somebody in that person's family may have committed this crime. And so you use that as a sort of a gateway to lead you to, oh, um, where was this person's uncle, brother, father, you know, whoever. Um, in relation to the victim and the and the context of the crime, and um, it's had remarkable results and and really solved a lot of these twenty you know year old cases, and so my hope isn't maybe that it might just work for Molly, but it might work for any of these unresolved cases in Massachusetts. I think about Patty Gagne in Worcester, who hasn't had her her crime solved. Um, there are a number of of names and faces and families that are in the same boat with us. Does the Lisa Ziegert case uh, give you hope knowing that 25 years after she was uh, murdered, there was finally an arrest? Absolutely, absolutely. And I cannot sing the praises of uh, District Attorney Galuni enough. I think his um, commitment and his use of technology and, and really digging into these uh, older cases and finding ways to solve them is remarkable. And I, I, I just, um, I have hope because of people like him that are in these positions of um, power and, and, and um, knowing that you have all these, you know, crimes that are happening today in the present. And then to be able to look back at, a, at an older case and say, no, we can still do this. And this is how we're gonna do it. Um, that gives me a lot of hope. And so I am incredibly grateful to the DA in, in Hampton County. And I, I just hope that um, other DAs will take similar actions. And your case is not in uh, Hampton County. Your case is in Worcester County. Right. Uh, because, you, because of where she was taken from in Warren. You had mentioned also um, that you spent the last 20 years trying to help police find a, mur a murderer. How does your family, um, you know, face each day? How do you face each day? Now you have a 21 year old daughter. Um, and this is your reality. I mean, how, how do you have the strength um, to continue doing this? Well, I think um, we've been very lucky in my family, although we've suffered some great um, tragedies and losses, we've um, been able to maintain um, simple things. Like for quite some time in the beginning, we would, we would have what we called Fragile Fridays and we'd meet at a um, local um, restaurant and have, you know, fried fish dinners. And each of us would be in a different place in our journey and in our grieving. And my parents were just building the foundation, but it kept us uh, tied together. And through those, you know, ties, we've also been surrounded by family and friends and our community. And um, I know that my friends are my saving grace. I, I wouldn't have been able to um, do this and, and, and be strong and be brave and be um, able to cry and, and, and have hard, bad tsunami days um, without my friends there it's holding my hand and sometimes holding me up, <laughs> but encouraging me and loving me and believing in me. And, and I think those connections um, are, are what's kept us able to continue on. Uh, the foundation was built on our kitchen table with um, my parents, very good friends and neighbors. Um, so we've been incredibly fortunate by the love that we've been surrounded with.